thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction. Uh, I think that the lavalier mic is on, so you should still be able to hear me, right? Terrific. Um, I'm just very, very pleased and proud to be invited to give this talk because I love this organization. I am a life member. I hope you will consider uh, making that commitment also. So there, I just ran my ad for SOCNOS. Um, but I do think there's one thing we need to do right now. This organization is celebrating an anniversary that's very important. So please, everybody in this room, on the count of three, a good, loud shout out, happy birthday, SOCNOS, okay? One, two, three. Happy birthday, SOCNOS! And congrats. Congratulations on 40 years of excellent work. This, our professions are much, much better off for all the tremendous things you've done for diversity. So, what I would like to do today is make an appeal to students. I was originally planning to talk about why everybody here should be interested in being a mathematician, um, and really you should be, it's a wonderful thing to do. However, uh, also I am, as indicated, interested in the mathematics of climate science and the fact that the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, only came out a few days ago. I thought this is a wonderful opportunity to make an appeal to the students in the audience and really everybody else in the audience about why you should be interested in this particular area. So, could we switch, to, actually could we switch to the, thank you, to the presentation. And I've got to grab my clicker. So yes, this is an appeal to students. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about careers and opportunities in climate science. These are areas where you can make terrific uh, terrific contributions no matter what it is that you're planning to do as a career because I can guarantee you this area is so interdisciplinary that there really is room for everybody. And in doing so, I just couldn't help but work in the theme of this conference too because this really is an opportunity to strengthen both the nation and the world through diversity, innovation, and leadership in fields that really need us there. And that's what I want to talk to you about first. So right, now, right up front, I do want to make it really clear what I'm talking about. Um, there are three things. Look, I'm a mathematician. I've got to show you a Venn diagram, so there you go. Um, there are three things you can talk about in this area. Climate science, environmental studies, sustainability. They're all very, very important and important uh, for us to be involved in. They have a big intersection, uh, much bigger actually than in that particular um, slide shows, but then I was kind of stretching my PowerPoint graphics facility, you know, ability just to get that up there. So that's what we've got. The intersection is bigger. But I want to talk specifically about the climate science piece of it. Um, anthropogenic, that means human-caused climate disruption. Not just global warming, but climate disruption is both a challenge and an opportunity because I believe that in the 21st century, mitigating it, trying to figure out how to reduce its impact and how we're going to be able to adapt to the impact that we can't avoid it's going to be one of the biggest scientific challenges we're going to be facing. It also presents, though, an opportunity for us, because it, there's so many ways that you can be involved in this, it's an opportunity for us to get more folks in our communities actually engaged in both the understanding and the participation of the, in these particular scientific areas. And it's important to do that for the reason um, that I've quoted up there. That's a very old quote. I'm not sure who first said it, but it really remains as true. It's been around for at least 20, 25 years, and it's as true today as it was back then. The people who have contributed least to the problem, that's us, the people who have contributed least to the problem will be those experiencing the earliest and greatest impact. And to see what some of that impact is, I'd like to show you a brief video. Could we see the first video, please? and fishing camps. There's always an air of excitement. 
But no one is hunting this year. Everyone is anxious. The geese haven't come. Everyone was expecting another year of record-breaking warmer temperatures. <coughs> Instead, it is cold. Two years ago, travel by skidoo was impossible because of all the mud and the early breakup of the rivers. Some people were even stranded out on the land. How can we prepare ourselves for such unpredictability? What will happen to us if we can no longer rely on our instincts and traditional wisdom? The changes that we've seen, this is knowledge that has been accumulated over many, many centuries. It's oral uh, tradition, it's uh, scientific knowledge, it's our scientific knowledge. Today, there are changes that are resulting in uncertainty. My mother worries. In the last few years here, there have been people drifted out on the ice because of the winds and the currents. Uh, we really have to watch what we're doing here uh, because uh, the ice is not as thick as it used to be. Uh, what we used to see around here was uh, some multi-year ice mixed with some of the ice that's frozen like this year. But uh, you don't see so much uh, multi-year ice around anymore. There's uncertainty because we don't know when to travel on the ice and our food sources are getting further and further away. We can't read the weather like we used to. It's changing our way of life. I believe that the Arctic is a very, very important uh, ecosystem to the health of the rest of the planet. So, yes, things are happening. It's already happening. Um, I'd like to just point out some of the science lessons. There was a lot of science in that video. Let's take a look at some of the takeaway science lessons from it. One of them is climate change is upon us. It's very real for the people you saw on Banks Island in that video. It's not something that's only a future threat. It doesn't have to be gradual. It can be sudden. It can be abrupt. And climate change does not really mean some sort of gentle global warming where maybe the springs are going to be longer and more pleasant. It's climate disruption. And it's increasing unpredictability. I want to give some examples of exposure to climate change that affect some of the different communities that are in this room. Um, African American populations, it's too strong a statement to say, well, African Americans tend to live in low-lying areas of the coastal cities, but they are disproportionately represented there. And sea level rise, um, I actually wrote this slide, I'll confess, sometime before Hurricane Sandy, but it really drove this point home. Sea level rise, perhaps combined in a, with an increase in storm intensity could become a problem. Maybe it already is a problem. Maybe sometime in this century we'll really see what a problem it is. I hope not. Native Alaskans and Pacific Islanders who are seeing, such as the citizens of the Pacific um, Island of Tuvalu, are seeing their islands, their nations, disappear under the water because of sea level rise. We have coastal erosion problems in Alaska and Canada where native villages are being pounded to pieces by waves whose action is no longer moderated by the ice that's not there anymore. Melting, this is already a problem. Caribbean populations, tropical storm intensity enhancement could be a problem, perhaps it already is. 
folks in New Orleans and in New Jersey may agree with that statement. Chicana Latino and Native American populations in the U.S. Southwest, here we are, right here. Temperature and water problems. This is already a problem in some area, but now I'm going to tell you that climate scientists are a little bit cautious about this one in particular. We're still waiting for results from attribution analysis to come in to tell us how much of perhaps some kind of cyclical climate behavior that's natural is happening and how much of it can be attributed to the climate change, anthropogenic climate change, but really there's no doubt that it's going to enhance and perhaps already is enhancing its impact. Um, did you notice the linkage of socioeconomic status? Um, as a university professor, I make pretty good money. And to some extent, I can get out of the way of this as it happens. Snowbirds have already, in fact, I live in a part of the world, uh, Michigan, that actually is likely to be least impacted in the long term about any place in the United States with climate change for a number of reasons. But snowbirds have always known that people who have money can get out of the way of these problems. You know, in the, in the wintertime, it gets cold in the north, the snowbirds fly to Florida, eat oranges, enjoy the weather, and then when things start to get pretty hot and muggy down there, you can always fly back north. And certainly, if you've got enough money, you can always turn on your air conditioner if it gets too hot or humid. But you know, for the Miccosukee and the Florida Seminole who live down there, for whom this is home, Elevating socioeconomic status doesn't solve the problem that if water rises a meter or two, the homelands just disappear. So the issue here is not just elevating everybody's socioeconomic status to be able to deal with this. There are deeper cultural issues involved. There is something here in getting more people involved with this. There's an analogy with Native American interest in biomedical careers. If you go around and you look at the poster presentations at this conference, it's remarkable how many students are interested in biomedical careers because I believe in many or most cases that's because there is a perception that's entirely accurate that there is a social injustice going on in the way that disease research, for example, is addressed. Maybe we get overlooked a little bit. Um, my family, diabetes, tuberculosis has impacted my Lakota, Mitahiepi, my relatives. Okay, my uncle was, is a tuberculosis survivor from when he was a child, but it really has not made his life very pleasant. So, um, so maybe if you're from the, what he's called the dominant, I don't know. I say the majority population, I prefer that. If you're from the majority population of this country, maybe you might be inclined to think the tuberculosis is no longer a problem. No, there's a lot of research that needs to be done there. So you're aware that you can do something about it too, which is very important because in order for students from different backgrounds to be involved in the biomedical sciences, you have to really feel like you can do something about it. And you're aware that you can, and that's great. That's fantastic that you're actually doing this work. The current and impending differential impact of climate change is just as much of a social injustice on minority and low-income groups. It's one we've got to start addressing. I want to show you some selected points from a climate change conference that was done about, well, 13, 11 years ago now um, in Bali. These came out uh, by a group of folks who were also participating in some of those activities. The Bali Principles of Climate Justice, and see just how many of these sound right for your groups. Climate justice affirms the rights of indigenous people and affected, and affected, affected communities, even not of indigenous people, to represent and speak for themselves. But you know, if we are going to represent and speak for ourselves, we have to know the science and we have to be involved in creation of that science. Climate justice demands that communities, particularly affected communities, play a leading role in national and international processes to address climate change. But again, if we're going to be at that table, we've got to be involved in doing the science and in understanding the science. Climate justice affirms the rights of communities dependent on natural resources for their livelihood and cultures to own and manage the same in a sustainable manner, and we have to have the knowledge to be able to do that. Climate justice recognizes the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples, 
and their right to control their lands, including subsurface lands, territories, and resources. We shouldn't be hiring that out. We should be doing it ourselves because we have the knowledge to do it. And finally, for everybody in the room, climate justice calls for the education of present and future generations. And everybody in this room is a um, member of a present or a future generation. I have not quite graduated to the point of being a member of a past generation. It emphasizes climate, energy, social, and environmental issues while basing itself on real life experiences, like those of the Kuptanas that you saw in that first video. Real life experiences and appreciation of diverse cultural perspectives. So, here's a question though. Maybe this is why we should be involved in it from our perspective, but suppose some Kennedy-esque figure, I actually heard Kennedy give that talk, I'm that old, where he said, ask not what you can do for your country. Well, suppose somebody was to say to us, ask not what climate science can do for you, but what can you contribute to climate science? We have a lot we can contribute. There's a lot of indigenous and local knowledge that could be offered, but also we are used to dealing, I think, with holistic ways, holistic ways of thinking about problems, and this area is so so very interdisciplinary that we have to be able to have those approaches to be able to attack them. I really think we have something to offer. I do have to also point out, though, as far as indigenous knowledge goes, that's a biggie because we can help address misinformation. I want to show you, this is a fairly famous uh, picture that you see rattling around on the internet. Uh, I took it from a book uh, written by a fella uh, who doesn't much believe that climate change is happening or that we're causing if it is happening. But it's a very famous argument. It goes like this. There's a picture there that you can see of the USS nuclear submarine skate surfacing at the North Pole in 1959 during a time where there should be a lot of ice. And yet there's no ice there in the picture. So the question is, if this melting stuff is new, how come there was a hole in the ice back then that they could service through? Well, Roger Kuptana, whom you saw talking about multi-year and single-year ice in that first video, has an instant response to that. He says, you don't know about Polinia? We deal with those all the time. My indigenous knowledge, my indigenous science has an answer for you. There have always been those holes in the ice. They don't have anything to do with the amount of the ice. It's just the dynamics of the ice creates them. Don't you know that? No, we have science we can offer. Okay, now, we also have communicating, the ability to communicate this that we can offer too. The best opportunity to initially to communicate is where uh, communicate issues with climate change is where it's already having a, a negative impact and that's in a lot of our communities. And actually, for those who think, think I'm only talking about the physical sciences here, no, the social sciences have a lot to say about this. It's very frustrating to scientists and particularly frustrating to mathematicians. I'll admit that when you go up front, you state your theorem, you proved it, you think your job is done, okay? But it's not just a matter of just getting the science right and stating it correctly because your, your students may say, okay, fine, that theorem's true, but why do I care, okay? There are lots of reasons to care here, and the evidence is strong, and it's not surprising that the messages communicated to any group about issues like this are best when they're coming from members of, the group, and you, of that group, and you'll see more about that in a minute. But first, I want to go through an issue of how in a lot of, excuse me, some information on how in a lot of different areas in which you might be interested, there are careers and opportunities to contribute to this even if you don't plan a career in the area. And the quote that I'm thinking maybe in some people's mind is, nice pitch, Dr. Meganson, but I'm planning to be a psychologist. Sorry that I can't help out. Native American psychologist and American Indian Science and Engineering Society Sequoia Fellow, Keith James, would disagree. Okay, psychology has a lot to say about this. Now here's what's going to happen. I'm going to show you some snippets of places that different uh, people from different backgrounds with different careers can contribute. And I decided that for each one of them, I was going to show you the cover of a book that you could look in um, 
from and get more information about this. I can recommend every one of these books that you see because they all came from my own library. Okay, well here's what Dr. James has to say. Most failures of change efforts result from unmanaged resistors rather than weakness of drivers. That's from a paper that's in this book that he wrote, that he co-wrote. Um, he's an organizational psychologist. What's that have to do with climate change? Here's an application of it. What he's saying is it's not just a matter of getting your message straight and saying it, it's also a matter of paying attention to what the people who are giving you contrary messages are saying because you have to deal with that because that is what causes most failures of change efforts. He's contributed to that, did not spend a lifetime, but he's found a contribution. Uh, Vicky Arroyo, who is executive director of the Georgetown Climate Center of Georgetown University Law Center, talks about what business, businesses can do to contribute. If you're interested in business, you know, if you're interested in going to business school, here's an area you can contribute to. It's imperative that the business community takes a leadership role in social awareness of climate change and its consequences. That's from a paper she has in this volume. Okay, well what about other things? You want to be a political scientist, there's a lot of work to be done in this area. But you know, even if you don't care one tiny bit about political science, I would still recommend that you get this book, Bert Boland's A History of the Science and Politics of Climate Change. Bert Boland was a previous chair, in fact he was the first chair of the IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I think that you just have to read this if you're interested in how political systems respond to challenging global issues because there's a lot to learn from this. Here's a quote from it. We were all part of a process in which national interests and national instructions governed our actions and limited the rate of progress. We were all painfully aware of this and we were on a learning curve. Wouldn't it be great if you were a political scientist who was grappling with some major global issue um, that was challenging and you were trying to describe, you're trying to decide how political systems would respond if you were able to read and absorb this book and figure out how you can jump in farther along on that learning curve. Highly recommended. And contributions to climate change really need to come from that arena. Um, there are huge opportunities to contribute in the biomedical sciences and the posters I see, I always see at SOGNAS indicate there are a lot of students here who are interested in that. Here's a great book, Changing Planet, Changing Health, How the Climate Crisis, crisis Threatens Our Health and What We Can Do About It. Are there contributions you can make? Let me read this. As the Earth's climate changes, it will do far more than maroon polar bears amid melting ice. Climate change has already contributed, attribution analysis shows this, it's already contributed to the remarkable 2003 heat wave in Europe that melted 10% of the ice in the Alps and killed more than 52,000 people. It has contributed to an extraordinary single day of drenching rains in Mumbai that killed 1,000 people, contaminated water supplies, and sickened hundreds. Attributed to it are at least 150,000 additional deaths worldwide each year and five million years of healthy life lost to disability. Clearly climate change is hazardous to your health. Biomedical scientists, I think there's a lot of things to be done there. Aren't, those are big problems and you can make contributions toward them. And it's going to be a particularly big problem if tropical diseases can expand their ranges toward us. Let me give you an example of that latter one. Uh, you hear this remark, okay? Malaria in Vermont, oh come on. Uh, my home state of Michigan has had a tiny number, not many but a few, uh, cases of local malaria that seems to be indigenous malaria in recent times, um, generally during very hot weather. Um, there's a case, I've listed a paper there if you're interested in this. This is a case in which a person who really didn't any, never did any, any international travel, um, apparently picked it up while on a camping trip out in the, out in the country. Um, after the person came down with malaria, folks went out there to see if there was anything that could have given to them there and they found native bred and born Anopheles mosquitoes containing locally bred and born Plasmodium disease agents. Does not, you know, if you want to come up to Michigan and come camping, look, this is not likely to happen to you, but it has happened to a few people, and if the temperature gets hot and stays there, it's going to be more. 
here's my own minuscule contribution to ecological biology, if that interests you. This is the chipmunk that should not have been there. One of my patients is climbing mountains. I had not been for some years to the summit of Mount Elbert, which is the highest mountain in the Rockies, so I decided I was going to go up there uh, this last summer. I had made it to the summit, and I was, this is not a real hard mountain, folks, but I made it to the summit, and I was on my way back down, 200 feet below the summit, this little critter, isn't that cute, okay, this little critter was sitting here begging, and I thought, a chipmunk at 14,200 feet? So I checked with folks who do ecological biology, and they said, yeah, that's, that's strange, because the highest known range for that particular kind of chipmunk, you went to chipmunks, is about 2,000 feet below that. If you're interested in ecology, I would contact the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, which is in a beautiful part of the world, about student programs. They've got some wonderful climate change problems for you to work on. Uh, computer science, this is a colleague of mine at the University of Michigan that wrote this book, A Vast Machine. Software specialists are needed to improve algorithm efficiency for the models, and better and faster hardware is also needed. It's really impressive. I think some folks from NCAR are here. It's impressive to go down into the basement of NCAR and see those monster computers that are working on those problems. The next generation has to be faster with better algorithms. If we're going to get the resolution really small enough that we can start to really look at closely at regional impacts. So lots of stuff for you to do there, too. How about mathematics? All right. Here's my love. Here's an example that is a contribution to applied mathematics, actually a contribution that applied mathematics has made to solving one of the defining problems of geology, which has been around since the early part of the 19th century, which is what caused the ice ages, ultimately. What was the ultimate trigger for the ice ages? It was suspected since the 19th century, uh, James Crawl was a big name in it back then, that orbital dynamics was caused, was a trigger for this thing, which is the way that the Earth's orbit varies as time goes on. Okay, um, but in order to do it, what you had to do is to be able to take a mess like that that shows the temperature of the Earth over the last two and a half million years, which looks like a bunch of jumbled up frequencies together, and find the dominant frequencies in it. Okay, this is what Fourier spectral analysis does. And when we finally had the data, and folks did the four, actually three people, uh, Hayes, Embry, and Shackleton, in 1976, did the Fourier analysis on that, and they knew if they could find that the predominant frequencies in there were at a, about 100,000 years, about 40,000 years, and about 20,000 years, that had settled it. They did the analysis, and here's what they found. Right on. You know, the biggest spike in the frequency spectrum is about at 100,000 years, then at 43,000 years, and a couple spikes close together near 20,000 years. And nobody has really doubted since then that the ice ages were caused by orbital dynamics. I can, if I can, you can corner me, I can give you more information on how that came about. Um, you can read all about it there. I just kind of ran through that one real quickly. It's a book called Ice Ages Solving the Mystery by one of the authors of that paper that talks about how they did that. Um, real quickly, critical transi transitions. If you're interested in those, that book is a little tougher reading than some of the other ones I've shown you, but it's accessible. Um, critical transitions in nature and society. Mathematics has to learn a lot more about how tipping points happen, critical transitions, a lot of work to understand them better, and also be able to detect when they're happening before you actually fall off the edge. So, um, you might be interested in that book. If you just want to know more about climate change and the IPCC findings, again, the ones for 2013 are just out, but for 2007, this is a wonderful book, Dire Predictions by Michael Mann and Lee Kump, two very famous climate scientists, that are a guide to the kind of things that the IPCC is telling you. And I highly re recommend that book. And everyone in this room can read this book. This is written for the person who does not have scientific training in this area. I want to show you one more video. Anybody from Haskell here? All right. You're going to, this video was made at Haskell. Native student filmmakers focus on climate change. ACES regulars will see someone in here whom you know well. Could we see the second video, please?
Are you recording? This global warming and climate change, it affects us all. My name is Raylene Elliott. I'm Kumia and Kuya from Southern California. Yeah, I think this project is really important because it we get a chance to show our perspective. It's um, spiritual, cultural, emotional ties to the land and the creatures on the earth. We saved the camera. In our creation story, we were the last things to be made. He made the earth and then he made the animals and he was telling the animals that he didn't know how we were gonna survive and live. And the animals, one by one, they stepped forth and sacrificed themselves for our sake. Mari Spala, Oglala Lakota. We are the ones that can provide the information that affects us specifically, but our people need to hear it from us. Hi, my name is Rache Castillo. I'm Navajo, Mississippi Choctaw. And I think as, as, as Native people, we should be um, more involved with this because we were taught in the old ways to respect the land and respect the earth. And we come from these elements. And I think that, that it should be a big part of our life. And then this is how we live in the circle. Where it's been colder, it's now getting warmer. And where it's been warmer or hot, it's getting cool, cooler. We don't know uh, just you know, where the seasons end anymore. We should all have a way, or we should have some responsibility addressing what you mentioned about climate change. And just to end this, I'm going to repeat something. I'm, my last slide is just going to be a quote from what Mario Spala, who is, uh, who is the fellow who is the uh, leader of that group that was doing that uh, filming on climate change. One quote that I think says it all. Our people need to hear it from us. Please consider contributing to this area and being involved because it's an enormously important problem. And I thank you for your attention.